Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for joining us today for our By the Book event, uh, our By the Book author talk. My name is Deirdre Kennedy, and I'm excited to introduce today's book, Seeing Silicon Valley, Life Inside a Fraying America, with photographs and stories by Mary Beth Meehan and an essay by Fred Turner. The authors, of course, are here with us today, and they are joined by their editor, Joseph Kalunia. Before I hand it over to them, I'll also note that this event is being recorded and uh, the video will be available on YouTube sometime soon, I think in the next day or so. Uh, so you'll be able to find that on our YouTube channel after the event. Um, if everyone could stay muted throughout the event, that would be very much appreciated. Uh, I'll also note that our by the book author talk events are presented in partnership with our wonderful friends over at the Seminary Co-op Bookstore here in Chicago. I will drop a link to the book uh, at the Seminary Co-op. I'll add that to the chat. Uh, so if you haven't picked up a copy yet, uh, you can uh, get it from them. And uh, we also, at the end of this event, we'll have a Q&A portion. So uh, any questions you have as we go for either of the authors or for the editor, Joe, just go ahead and drop them into the chat bar. And uh, I will introduce our esteemed guests. Mary Beth Meehan is an independent photographer and writer known for her large scale community based portraiture centered around questions of representation, visibility, and social equity in the US. Fred Turner is Harry and Norman Chandler Professor of Communication at Stanford University. He's also the author of several books, including The Democratic Surround and From Counterculture to Cyberculture, also published by the University of Chicago Press. And Joseph Kalamia is a senior editor in the books division at the University of Chicago Press. He acquires new titles in the life sciences, physical sciences, mathematics, digital studies, and environmental studies. Uh, and um, the book has been praised in the New York Times, San Francisco Chronicle, Boston Globe, Los Angeles Review of Books, Washington Post, Arts Fuse, and that's not all. So uh, with that, I will let them take it away and I will hand it over to Joe or whoever, will, whoever wants to uh, talk next. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you, Mary Beth and Fred for the chance to publish this book. And um, thank you, Deirdre, for the introductions and for your work too in promoting the book. Um, as you just said, it has received amazing coverage and inspired, I think, really important conversations about the Silicon Valley. And so, again, so glad that this, this book is out in the world. And I'm so glad that today we have the chance to meet with Mary Beth and Fred and hear more about their collaboration um, and the origins of this book. Um, starting off, we, we thought it might be good to hear from you about what is this book, given that not everyone has a copy um, yet. And so um, I'll let you you take it away from there. Great. I, maybe I'll start, Mary Beth, and then we jump in together. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Great. Um, and first off, I I'm, thank you all for being here. And thank you especially to Joe and, and to Deirdre, um, without whom this book wouldn't be, Joe especially. And one of the things that I hope we can talk a little bit about today is Joe, Joe's role in bringing this book into being, because it's been really substantial. Um, so, so yeah, about four years ago, um, I was here in Silicon Valley, and I had been thinking quite a bit about the differences between the mythology of Silicon Valley, which I wrote about academically, and life on the ground. You know, I've been living here almost 20 years. I live in Mountain View, a couple of miles from Google. 
And the Silicon Valley I see every day when I go to my local taqueria or when I go to the gas station is very different than the one depicted in the press. The one depicted in the press tends to feature sort of heroic, mostly younger white men um, who are thought to be geniuses who somehow spawn out of their male genius, um, these new technology companies and a new future with them. And in fact, what I could see on the ground was, was, was a world in which there are people of lots of different colors, lots of different um, backgrounds, all working together to, to make the kind of world that we, we inhabit. Um, I also saw a world of dramatic inequality. And that was something that I just wanted to help make visible. So I, I had a little grant and Stanford helped a little bit. And um, someone introduced me to Mary Beth Meehan. Um, and I, I was just absolutely thrilled to be able to work with Mary Beth. And I, I think she'll show you some images in a sec. But we were able to bring her out to Stanford as a visiting artist and to collaborate for a long period of time. Um, and, you know, as I think you'll see, Mary Beth's work has a, a kind of ability to do this, this odd twinned thing be very respectful of the people in the book. And so she made images of a whole array of different kinds of people, but also to be systematic and to show the kind of structure of the society to which these people belong. And that combination of individual attention to the actual nature of the people in the, in the business with the, the sort of effort to, to photograph everyone from the, the lady at the taqueria to the, the high-tech entrepreneur and make them all visible, I think that was also kind of, kind of wonderful. And so, um, so we were able to work together. And, and Mary Beth, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Fred. Thank you, Deirdre, for holding this event. Thank you, Joe. I do want to talk about our work with Joe because it's been pure pleasure and we're so grateful that it that it happened. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I see Jill Wiley's here and Fred will say that it was when he saw my work um, from Brockton, which is my hometown in Massachusetts, post-industrial New England, that he realized he wanted to invite me to Silicon Valley. So see that, Jill? We did a good thing and 10 years ago, <laughs> 10 years ago when we worked on that long project together. Um, I think what I'd like to do is start, Joe, should I just start and show a few pictures to give them a sense of, to give everybody a sense of what the book is like, and then we can go from there. That sounds great. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. So um, I received this phone call uh, from a, um, from an old colleague named Elodie Maillet, who was a Knight Fellow at Stanford, who was, had been working with Fred um, on thinking about how diverse Silicon Valley was. It, this was the early stages of the book. And the invitation from Fred was to come there and to do my work to see what Silicon Valley was about. And at that moment, I was as flabbergasted as anyone else would be if they received an invitation to come and work on a body of work that showed what Silicon Valley was about. Because I thought, what on earth could I have to offer to this place that was like going to the moon or the Vatican or something crazy like that? I mean, the mythology was as big in my mind as it is in anyone else's. And I went to meet Fred and I realized that it was just following the same process that I developed over the years of meeting, doing as much research as possible and trying to think about what the space is. And that was where our early conversations really were important. And Fred was sending me books and talking about Silicon Valley and what it looked like in the press versus what it was, and then meeting people. So on my, I wanna just show you a few pictures from the book that came out of that early time of really just groping around and being in my rental car and trying to talk to strangers and figure out through those interactions what the space was about. So this was when um, my very first trip in the summer of 2017, before I even knew if I would do the fellowship, I stayed in an Airbnb in Mountain View in this little um, bungalow. And this is Erfan and it was her uh, bungalow and I, couldn't figure out why would a family in Mountain View with this beautiful little house want to rent out the whole back. It was only a two bedroom bungalow, but they had it all separated and I was staying there and I hadn't met her. But I sent her a message on Airbnb saying I'm, I'm trying to do a project about what life is like here. Could I make a portrait of you? I hadn't seen her or anything, but I just wanted to dive in and she met me, or we, we set a date and she met me in the front of the house and she came to the door. This picture was actually made, I reshot this. This picture was made in the fall when the persimmons were in, uh, the persimmon tree was in fruit. But she said, oh, it's very, it's very difficult here. You know, her husband worked at Google. They had come from Iran via Canada to Silicon Valley. And they really thought that when they got there, this 
miracle would happen of wealth and security. And in fact, they felt stressed. They felt that it was a difficult environment to be in. There was a lot of insecurity. And I went back to Fred and told him that even the person whose Airbnb I'm staying in wants to talk to me. There was an eagerness to share her experience. So in every case, when I met people, when I said, we're doing a book about what life is like in Silicon Valley, everyone had something to say about that. So it was really just a matter of meeting the people and providing the space for them to share that view. So, um, you know, in those early days, I, I was trying to show the materiality of what's it like to be from Iran, but be living in Mountain View. These are her grandmother's pearls from Tehran, really just kind of groping around visually. This is Imelda when I went back in the fall of 2017. So I did six weeks uh, in the fall of 2017 at Stanford. And this time I had an Airbnb in Menlo Park and a rental car. And I just would get up in the morning as early as I could and go out and come back. And sometimes I made appointments with people. Sometimes there were activists in the area that would introduce me to people or research I had done. And sometimes it was just stopping strangers. And this is Imelda who was coming out of the house across from where the Airbnb, my Airbnb with another woman and a bucket and a mop. And I stopped her and I speak some Spanish. And I said, you know, I'm doing this book, same spiel. I'm doing this book about Silicon Valley. And would you explain, you know, would you be willing to work with me? And she gave me her address, which was a gas station. She told me to meet her at a gas station in Redwood City, which I thought was weird. And so I pulled into the gas station and she met me and we walked around the corner into a driveway of a friend's house into the trailer where she was living. So really right off the bat, um, it was clear that there was something going on. And this is me, again, just sort of photographing getting um, involved with people like Silicon Valley Rising, these different groups who are doing work for immigrant rights. I'm sorry about my neighbor's dog. It'll, I hope it'll stop in a second. I hope you can hear, can hear that. Trying to think about what workers, what life was like for workers there. This is Teresa, who is of course the cover of the book. She was um, working in a food truck in Palo Alto. And, you know, I was at the end of the day and just trying to have dinner. And, but I saw her in there and I was so struck by her that I asked if I could come into the truck and make this portrait. And so she got permission and I was able to do that. And I only took three or four frames and then went back and interviewed her and her daughter. Mary Beth, can I, can I jump in for just two yeah. seconds? Course. I just want to flag why this image in particular is so important. And I want to say just a couple of things about Mary Beth's work. You know, we were very concerned to help people who had been rendered invisible to the larger world, although obviously not to their friends and family, visible and to see them in, in a way that had been offered, I think, only to, to elites before. And one of the things that I love about this image and Mary Beth's work more generally is that it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a there's a little bit of Pieta floating in here. And this is a person who, you know, I, I can assure you living here, folks buy tacos, tacos, taquerias all the time and literally don't see the person behind the, the counter. And by seeing this person, I'm hoping that we you know, kind of reveal the working life on which the city depends and the deep humanity of the people who inhabit it and work in it and are just entirely rendered invisible by stories of you know, the iPhone and Apple and technological change. So I just wanted to kind of say, wow, what a picture. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, that is the goal of the, that is the goal of the book. I mean, that is the goal of the book to just re be reminded that these are human, human communities built on human labor and spirit and soul and all of that. Um, so I just want to, I'll just go quickly. You know, this is, this is Abraham and Brenda. And so I think what struck me, you know, Fred talked a lot about me and the post-industrial New England roots and all that, and being able to see things that other people maybe who were more um, steeped in Silicon Valley who lived there couldn't actually see. But it's pretty hard to miss the long lines of trailers that are lining the Stanford campus. So when you come into the Stanford campus and there are all these beautiful palm trees this way, perpendicular to those is a long row of trailers that people are living in, right along, what is that street? El Camino Real? El Camino Real, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, and what, what's clear and what's shocking is that these are working people. These are people who are in, I mean, and I know that there are people who are without homes who've lost those homes for various reasons. But the majority of the people in those trailers, including I was told a young woman who worked at the Stanford bookstore are people who are working in Silicon Valley. And so this was the first, this is Abraham and Brenda. 
Um, and this was the first inkling that I got that these are working people. These are people working full time, sometimes multiple jobs who are not able to make ends meet. So what the press has done, not only to focus in on the on the Zuckerbergs at the top, but also sort of, you know, the tent city in, in San Francisco is to look at those extremes, but to not show the subtleties of those extremes to say that these are people in the middle in many ways. Abraham had his own business for many years. He lost it in the crash of 2008. They lived in improvised homes. So I, I, I want to be conscious of not spending too long on the pictures, but I'm just trying to show you the trajectory. So then in working with, um, I was introduced to a group that was working with the AFL-CIO of Tesla workers who were trying to unionize. So from that, from those early stages of Imelda and Erfan and, and meeting people on the street, I was able to get in through different organizations to talk about the people like Richard who made six figures in the auto industry in the 90s and now is making $40,000 a year on the floor of Tesla until he started to try to organize and then lost his job. Or Ravi and Gutami who had come from India with advanced degrees through graduate school and came here and are now living in an apartment that's you know three thousand dollars for one bedroom and are thinking how do we raise a family here i mean we worked all the way to get from india to here and but we don't think we're going to be able to stay there's this kind of insecurity to justina who actually does very well you know i, I well i don't want to speak for her but she's a high level engineer in ai so her contribution to the narrative of the book is not about finances, but it's about sort of ethics. You know, she wanted to do work in disaster response. She wanted to do AI for disaster response, but she said, nobody buys disaster response. Nobody wants to fund it. It's a capitalist model. You have to make stuff that people want to buy. So she, this whole making the world a better place and saving the world became sort of empty for her. And there was a kind of disillusionment for her in that. Constance, who's a teacher in Menlo Park, I really wanted to show how teachers and firefighters and police public servants were having to drive two hours each way because these people can't afford to live in the communities that they serve. And what does that mean about community breakdown versus a kind of community cohesiveness that we had in Brockton when I was growing up or that might be available in other parts of the United States where the, court, you know, the companies aren't creating so much stress on the people living there. This is Warren who like Justina had done well. He was a venture capitalist, he'd gone to Stanford, um, but he talks about sort of the ethical codes that the big companies make and how if you wanna grow a company, you have to think about whether or not you're willing to cross those lines to get that big. And um, his decision was not to do that. Mark, whose mother worked in the electronics industry and so suffered some severe birth defects because of her exposure to lead in that industry. And Cristobal, I'll stop here on Cristobal, who I met, he's an army veteran. He was born in California. Um, he full -time, works full-time in security at Facebook. And I met him through an organization. And again, he gave me his address and we met at the front of the house, but we walked around to the back of the house where he was living in this little shed because he couldn't afford a place to live in Silicon Valley. So, and again, this is the first time, this is a full-time worker at Facebook. Um, so I just, I'll stop there and. Hi, Mary Beth, can I just offer a summary to answer Joe's question? Yes. Yeah, so, so. Um, Joe's question, did I totally avoid it? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, we, we're gonna, we're doing it together, it's great. So, so what I hope the audience sees is, is you know, the book is a collection of portraits and stories um, of, of people who live in the Valley at every social level, all the way from, you know, um, folks who live in the garden shed to folks who are entrepreneurs. And, you know, I think our, our guiding logic is, is one of, you know, people tell us that Silicon Valley is a model for the future. It's a model for America. It's a city on a hill. Well, if it's a city on a hill, then we need to look pretty hard at who's here, because what we see in our mythology is a mythology of sort of saints, right? Very special people who go to this special place and make the future much as we once saw the american puritans as very special people who entered an empty wilderness these folks are imagined to be working in an empty wilderness when in fact much like plymouth massachusetts eons ago this region is inhabited it's a region where native peoples have been wiped out systematically it's a region where race still plays a, a very serious role it's a region that looks a lot like america in the inequality that's that's a borning and just to give you a taste of the numbers behind some of the images that mary beth is working with here during the pandemic, 
40%, four in 10 Silicon Valley families were food insecure. Before that time in 2018, 17% of pregnant women could not be guaranteed enough to eat. This is, in, this is in one of the wealthiest regions of the world where half, count them, half of the globe's billionaires live. There's, in 2018, there were 74 billionaires here. Now, if this is the world that we're going to be building with our technologies, I think it's a world that we should be concerned about. And if we, the only way to become concerned about it from, from our perspective, I think, is to see the people who are actually here. And that's the work of the photography and of the book. Joe, back to you. No, that's I'm sorry, great. I didn't that's answer the question, Joe. No, you did. You did. That was that, that's so great. I would love to hear more about how you decided to collaborate. You touched on this a bit, but how you decided to collaborate and what the process was, you know, of, of finding these stories and and choosing what stories to to tell in the book. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about that, that'd be great. Mary Beth, do you want to go? You talk about how you want why you want to collaborate first. Okay, so so I wanted to collaborate with someone even before I knew about Mary Beth and her work, um, because I wanted to visualize what was here. I, I can write just fine, and I write academically all the time, um, but there's something about seeing the people who are here and seeing the world that I thought was really important for two reasons. One, I wanted to undercut the mythology, and two, I wanted to preserve a vision of the places it actually was. So I, I'm an American historian, I'm an American cultural historian, and you know I've often asked myself. If I were in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620, what would I have taken away from there? What would I have recorded? What would I have taken pictures of? Well, Silicon Valley is in some ways like Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620 today. It is helping bring about a really new kind of, of life for all people. I wanted to make sure that we had a good record of that. When we went, and then when Mary Beth and I, well, first I saw Mary Beth's work in Brockton and, and Mary Beth should talk about what kind of work you did in Brockton, but it, 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 it showed me again, this, this mix of intense, ability to make personal relationships with her subjects and to have a civic vision about what a good community might be like. So, so, and then, oh, last piece. Uh, Mary Beth is just a pleasure to work with. I just want to get this on the table. Like when we met, I mean, I think Mary Beth is a little like, oh, who's this professor? I don't know, he's awful bookish. And, you know, we, I mean, Mary Beth is, a, is, a, is just, she's very straight spoken and very sympathetic and empathetic. And we just work together pretty well. I mean, I, I just, and we're very direct with that. Lots of tussles, but always productive ones. So I just thought I it was- just say Joe was present for some of our tussles. So you better not make it sound too, uh, too no. rosy. <laughs> no, the feeling is absolutely, feeling is absolutely mutual. It was a joy to be invited. Um, and, and that brings me to this point about collaboration. So here's what, I mean, in terms of the field, I think one of the reasons why we get Zuckerberg and the, and the, and the homeless encampments is that photographers go into places not really knowing what it is they're seeing. And so the joy uh, and, and sort of only being able to visualize the most extreme examples of, of, of what life offers. So the time being invited to be able to be there for that amount of time and to be able to be funded for that amount of time to be able to stay there and really see it deeply is part of, a part of the collaboration, part of why we, I think we get that middle, but also because Fred knows his stuff about the place. So we had this really parallel path of process where I would go out and meet people and, you know, I'm doing all the reading he's giving me and I'm, you know, doing all my, you know, and meeting people and then coming back in and we wrestled with it week after week. We had these weekly dinners at his house where we really talk through what is it that we are seeing. So it wasn't that he gave me an assignment to fulfill his ideas. It wasn't that I asked him to write an essay about the pictures that I'd made. We really developed it together over time, which is why we wanted to, wanted it to be co-authored. And I really, I mean, I think I love that kind of collaboration and I wouldn't want to go back to just trying to do things on my own. No, I think it, it really, it, I think it's evident in the, in the book, um, the shaping that's come from that and, and working with you both in how the book has even evolved, you know, um, as some, some, some background, the book was originally published in French, um, in France, and, and it has continued to evolve from that original publication um, into this with new research um, and new photos and um, an attempt to, to incorporate the happenings of even this past year, which is, is hard to do. So um, can I say a little bit about the French round and then and bring you in and ask you a question? Sure. Great. So, so for folks who, who may not know, um, Mary Beth and I are privileged to have a, a truly fabulous French publisher, CNF Editions in Paris. 
and uh, they've translated all my stuff and they did this book in French and they're, they're brave and, and smart and very interested in making visible the, the tech world that's aborting. And when we, when we first put our first round of this book together, we did shop it in the United States and only one editor was excited about it really. And that was Joe Calamia. <laughs> Joe was, Joe, was, Joe, was, Joe was great. And Joe was at Yale at the time and was overruled and was unable to acquire the book. Um, right. And the French were all over it. The French, French were like, no, this is really important. We've got to have it. What's been intriguing to us is coming back now with this round, when Joe moved to Chicago, he was able to, to pursue it. Coming back now for this round and watching the book hit big in America, it's been really interesting to see and to think about why why it's flying now and why it didn't earlier. When we, when we first brought the book around a couple of years ago, people would say to us, oh, well, you know, what we really want to see are the sort of tech bros. We want to see the, you know, the, the people at Burning Man. We want to see the burners. Or we want to see the trailer people. But the idea of a larger community, of its diversity, its inequalities, that was not accessible to folks at the time, except to Joe and, and to our French editor. And, and Joe, could you just say a little bit, of, of, or Mary Beth, I don't mean to cut you off, but I was going to just ask well, Joe. No, I mean, I'm just curious. I'm curious about that too, because why the change? You know, I mean, we 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 had we had a lot of people say, well, it's not really Silicon Valley, or you know, well, you've done an interesting book here, and then you know, not really grab it. So, I mean, I'm interested in hearing from you guys why the change. Yeah, and I'm also interested in hearing from you, Joe, in, in sort of yeah. what you spotted then. I mean, so Joe, for folks who are on the call may not know, Joe is is the preeminent editor in the sort of sciences working today and in the science and culture intersection, especially. Um, and I, I feel really, really lucky to have him in this. But Joe, given your brief, how and how and why did you come to a project like this? No, well, I, I feel like, um, thank you for that. That's very kind. But I, I feel like as an acquisitions editor, um, one of my, my former colleagues described that you're in graduate school forever and it's the greatest thing because you're you're learning from your authors and the community um, that your your authors form. And and one of those authors who was, I, I was gonna mention her book and I didn't even know that she would be on the club is Sarah Roberts. Um, so I, I worked with her on her, on her book uh, behind the screen, which is on content moderation. And um, she, is looking at the people who really protect us from the worst that humanity has to offer um, these content moderators. And um, they're purposely rendered invisible. And that book um, you know, really made an impact on me. And, and then you know, on the tales of that, I get a proposal from Fred Turner, who's someone who I've wanted to work with for a long time um, with these stunning images um, from Mary Beth. And this is, it just, it, in a, in a similar way, you know, you're, you're trying to, to, to render this community visible. And so um, that was an easy pitch to make to me. And um, I feel like it, it really spoke to a, a moment that we're in and, and, and is doing important work. It also is a book that has to be a photography book, um, which is, is very hard to get, you know, published at, at many houses because of the, the, the production and, and um, you, if, you, if you're going to do it, you have to do it right, which is, it, we were very lucky to, to work with Mary Beth um, and Lucy Hitchcock, who designed the book, um, as well as, you know, my colleagues in design and production at Chicago, which really know what, you know, they really know what they're doing and working with, with um, the printers to, to pull it off. And so um, it, it really had to be an alignment of, of the right publishing home and, and also um, an, an eagerness to to, to pursue it. So I felt very lucky that um, I moved to Chicago and didn't have to steal Fred Turner from Chicago. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and um, at the same time, I felt like it, it was an important book and um, wanted to, 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 to see that work out there. So, so I'm, again, very grateful for, for it all working out as it did. Oh, thanks. I mean, I, I, I want to. So, so first, I want to also join you in in in, in cheering for Sarah's book. I, I know that book really well and, and love it. And I think that Sarah's work um, points a, into a direction that I know you've been building lists a, around before, which is, is a kind of intersection of um, technology and culture an analysis, but also kind of revealing what the world is becoming. And you know, one of the things that I'm hoping we've achieved in this project, and I know Sarah's achieved in her work is a, a way of seeing analytical questions that are fundamentally academic, but also public in an idiom that's accessible to both worlds. And, and I think that's something that scholars, I hope, will do a lot more of. I know Sarah's doing it and some other folks on this call are doing it too. And, and I, I, I think that's really important. And I, I think a visual sensibility really helps there. And I think Mary Beth's sensibility in particular works. 
Yeah. No. Oh, sorry. No, 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 you go. <laughs> well, I'm just wondering, do you guys think it's that the moment in the country has changed? I mean, what, I mean, you know, for this book to, for this book to have taken off and to have, you know, gotten so much visibility, just it's only out a month today, right? May 3rd is when it comes out. But really not that long ago, we really were getting like crickets from American editors far and wide. So what do you think that is? Is it just that Joe had the good sense to see it? Or is it something a moment in the country has changed and it's it's more yeah, income inequality? I mean, you know, what do you guys think? I have my thoughts on it, but Joe, what do you think? I mean, I, I don't know, because in, in some ways the book, you know, any book takes so much time to develop um, that it's capturing more than just a, a snapshot of, of a particular moment. I think we're so slow to recognize what scholars, um, you know, have been, have been identifying. And so, you know, work that is done um, in the academy that journalists pick up later, you know, I think, um, you know, you're, you're, you're hitting the, the trends before, um, you know, it's, it's becomes more public um, and same is true of, of, of Sarah's work. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's, it's right. a moment that we're continuing to live and we, we need um, different ways of presenting it. And this is a, this is a different way of presenting it. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I mean, that's been, so I was a journalist for 10 years before I, I turned academic, and I, I have had that strange experience of feeling like academics tend to see things ahead of journalists. Right. Journalists are supposed to be constantly on trend. And I right. thought that was really, it's been really interesting to, to, to watch that. Mary Beth, I, you know, I, I think that one of, the, one of the key features is George Floyd. And I, I just think that, that there's a, we're at a moment where in America, we can begin to see race, we can begin to see inequality, um, the, the, you know, recognition that Amazon workers are among, have the highest injury rates in, in the um, warehouse world. You know, that kind of stuff is, is finally coming out. Also, people here in the Valley are starting to protest and speak up. And so I, I think all those things help. I, I, but I'm still, I am still a little bit mystified because the thing that we couldn't do early on was get folks to appreciate the, the complexity of the Silicon Valley ecology. People wanted stories, you know, National Geographic did a, did a feature on Silicon Valley about the time we started working together. Right. And, all cuddle puddles. And if folks don't know what a cuddle puddle is, a cuddle puddle is when a group of, you know, usually young men and women um, puddle together, they form a pool on the ground and they cuddle together. And it's, it's non-sexual, but sort of warm and fuzzy. And it's a, it's a thing a lot of tech folks do. And so, you know, and it makes great, great camera, you know, it's like, boom, oh God, tech, tech bro cuddling. Eek. That's where the discussion was when we started. And, and so I feel really, really happy that, that we're not there anymore. Yeah. Nancy Peterson just put a note in the chat that says um, high visibility of those who are hit so hard by COVID. That's true. Essential workers uh, upon whom so much of this book uh, depends. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. I think it's back to you, Joe. Uh oh, I <laughs> froze there for a sec. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I think. Um, I, I I do wonder about the the format of the book too, and and how Hervé uh, in at, at CNF, um, you know how how he was able to do that so quickly because I think that you know, that was my challenge originally is that you know the concept of the book um, really was something that I wanted to pursue, but at the same time it's hard to to get a book like this, and so it, you know I, I think um, you know the the visual format of it. I wonder if you could you know you could talk a little bit about about that um say that which part joe just sort of the, lay, the way we conceived of the pieces yeah the, the way you can see the pieces that between the image the portraits and the stories and um yeah. you know one thing that you know, you know looking at it and reading it you have the stories that that sometimes you 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 don't know what happens with with some of these um in some of these stories and you feel this need to to know what happens and i think in some ways that that adds to the visibility because i continue to think about the people who are in this book um and i wondered if that was intentional or if, you know how that worked in your in your in your constructing of the book well it's interesting there's a question i have been keeping kind of a quarter of an eye on the chat, but there's a question about, um, did we always know it was going to be a book? And in fact, we didn't. I mean, I went there and I really immersed myself for the six weeks and I made all these portraits and we had these dinners and he was talking and I was talking, we're wrestling and arguing and doing our maps. I've got like reams and reams of scribble pads, you know, and I came back to Providence 
and we were a little bit overwhelmed and we were actually a little bit grumpy, you know, and, and, and I said, okay, I'm just going to edit everything. I'm going to edit my favorite portraits. And I have long interviews. Every single person that I met with, I did long, long interviews, hours, sometimes over days. Sometimes I would do the interviews and then we'd be so exhausted. I'd go back the next day and make the photo or I'd make a portrait because I really wanted to hear from their perspective about their life, but also as Fred's saying, how they how it all fits together. It really, I really needed to get it, how it all fit together. And each person was contributing a piece of that. So I came back to Providence, I edited the pictures down to my favorite images, the ones that really I felt were the, were the ones, you know, that were authentic to my interaction with the people. And I transcribed all those hours of interviews and I wrote these short pieces that were kind of, what were the salient points that everyone kind of contributed? What was that moment when I said, oh, this is what this is about? You know, like in the, all those hours, ah, this is, the, this is the contribution he's just made that's different from. So Fred didn't know what he was gonna do. And I remember being in the car in the pouring rain waiting for my mother was in a doctor's appointment or something. And I was in the car talking to Fred and I, and I remember saying to you, just let's make a poem. You go write your essay. Let's just put it together as a poem. You write all the stuff that you've been talking about with the Puritans and all these beautiful metaphors and the land and the toxicity and the technology. Let me put this whole thing together and we'll put a dummy together. And I actually went into Lightroom and did a stupid dummy you know, that looked terrible. And Lucinda Hitchcock is my dear friend and she's a wonderful, amazing art book designer. And she's a professor at RISD here in Providence. And she said, oh my God, look at that. Let me, let me, let me make something for you that you can shop around. Yeah. So she made this piece that um, we then took to Hervé. Go ahead, Fred. Does that sum it up? I, I, Lucy, yeah, that was great. Lucy, Lucy was amazing. And, and Joe, you and the team at, at Chicago were also amazing. And the book is beautiful, far more beautiful than, than, than most of its kind. And, and I, I do want to emphasize for folks on the call that, that getting a photography book published is very difficult. Um, it's, it's not a book for which there are obvious, obvious markets. The only other thing I want to say, and Mary Beth, I think caught it, caught it really nicely, is that we were back and forth on edits all the way along, all the way to the bitter end. You know, Mary Beth edited every word of my essay a number of times. I went back over every word of those, those stories. And um, we were quite tough on each other in, I think, a very good way. I, you know, Mary Beth pushed me very hard on, on thinking about race and the Puritans. And I pushed Mary Beth pretty hard on adverbs. So, you know, we, uh, we, we, <laughs> we got Bitter end is right. <laughs> it was good. We were right, right at the last minute. Hey, I wanted to, to pick up on um, on Sarah's question there too, because it's right on this point, what, and it's in the chat. What role does, does Stanford um, play in the, in the unfolding story? Um, two roles, I think. One is just they help fund the project. Um, I had a small grant from the Wallenberg Foundation, which was the beginning of our project, and then Stanford gave me a matching grant um, from the Arts Foundation to bring Mary Beth out. But more more generally, I think that you know. Um, my colleagues at Stanford have had a mixed reaction to the book. Some have been very excited mm -hmm. about it. Others have, have, have kind of um, carefully not seen it. And it's been really interesting to see that, that kind of reaction. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in my office now and I look out my window and the building I see outside my window is the building where the Google algorithms were written. And, you know, when I ride my bicycle home tonight, I'm going to ride my bicycle past a whole lot of trailers where people live. And from my perspective, Stanford is, is, is one of the engines that is producing both the people, producing the people, the technologies, and to some degree, the mythology that make Silicon Valley run. And if that's the case, then I think we have an exceptional responsibility um, to be, be looking at the people at the edge of our campus and to be, be rethinking how we do what we do here um, to change the world beyond the walls. No, I, I mean, I, I thought it was, in your in your introductory essay, you talk about how the Silicon Valley is a mirror for America, and and also um, this you know kind of beyond this reflection, it's also a model in which other places around the world are 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 building their own Silicon Valleys. And so I wondered if if you could talk a little bit about how you how you you both see the impact of the book beyond the United States. Sure. Uh, do you want to jump on that, or do you want to... you go ahead? So, so I, I think I've been both surprised. And delighted that it has had an impact beyond the United States. I mean, there have been long pieces in Germany and Brazil, other countries. And I think that's because Silicon Valley really has been a model um, around the world. There are discussions in France and Germany now about whether cultures in those countries need to change and become more networked and individualistic and flexible so as to be innovative in a technological and economic sense like Silicon Valley. 
I'm very confident they don't, but, but some folks over there are worried that they do. Other, in other nations, uh, China, South Korea, um, nations have deliberately tried to build regions that had the characteristics of Silicon Valley. And what that tells me is that, that, that we need to take a moment and say, okay, look, if everybody's gonna replicate this model, then we need to think about the kind of society as a whole that we're building here. This model works terrifically well for the 74 billionaires, but how does it work for the several million people who live on the ground? Is the purpose of business simply to increase one's wealth so that one can buy a $500 million yacht, as Jeff Bezos is currently seeking to do? Or is the purpose of business, as many businessmen themselves believed 70 years ago, right. is the purpose of business instead to yeah. improve the lives of the communities in which businesses are located? I think it's the latter, and I would argue that Mary Beth probably does too. Mary Beth, over to you. Well, and this gets back to Brockton, <laughs> because, you know, in my, in my thinking, I was sort of like, what, you know, I spent my whole life in New England, and I've done projects in other parts of the country, but, you know, having come from a working class immigrant background where really secure communities were built, I mean, those people, those people were unskilled laborers, some of whom were from Ireland, some were from Italy who didn't speak English, but who were able to really amass some equity and some wealth and to create a standard of living for me. I mean, those, I think of those, I think of my childhood as being a really sound one. And I mean, our parents worked really hard. My father was a fireman, but he lived in the community that he served. I knew everyone because he knew everyone. It was tight knit. I mean, I don't know if Jill wants to comment. There is, I, I don't want to sound too romantic like Mr. Rogers neighborhood or anything, but there was a kind of security that those people were able to build doing unskilled labor and then in the next generation working class working class jobs and blue collar jobs and the people in silicon valley are not able to amass that kind of security there and it makes for me when i was there an an an, an overall there's an there's there's a feeling of instability that i experienced in silicon valley that really shocked me it felt almost like like one feels in the developing world where this tension of people really struggling could erupt at any time. I mean, that kind of suffering in people's lives, it really did start to feel a little bit like this could erupt at any time. And it felt unstable. And it felt so ironic that knowing that Facebook and all of these corporations are right there and they are actively creating a kind of instability in the social fabric, the social cohesion of the communities that we had in Brockton with my father as a, fire, as a fireman. I mean, so I think that that does say something about the way the American economy has changed since the 1980s. It's, it's, it's a kind of end game capitalism that is not, you know, I mean, I think the president now is starting, is trying to look at that and and say, where are we headed? We're not headed somewhere where people are enjoying more stability. And so that is a dangerous, that's a dangerous path. Hmm. I, mean, so I noticed that we're, we're toward, toward tight on time. Do we want to open it up for questions? Yeah, I was looking at some of the questions in the chat. Um, and I, I don't know if, if, if people want to jump in or if I should just read, I'll read some of the ones that are oh, in here already. Yeah. Um, but when was, yeah. To what extent did you encounter people in the in the faith community? And so I, I know Mary Beth, some of the stories are are directly related. So I wonder if you could talk about that. It's funny. I was um, I was became very close to a, um, a, a pastor named Dave Watermolder in Los Gatos, which was a Providence connection. He was the pastor at a church right up here in my neighborhood, and I contacted him when I went out there, and he introduced me to Mary, and he introduced me to G in Virginia, and he, you know, really talked about kind of the sp the spiritual stressors in a place like Silicon Valley that you know that is not really focused around the spiritual when it comes to achievement. And then um, Geraldine, Gerald, uh, Geraldine is a woman that runs a, a tiny little church in, in um, Belhaven, which is a, 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 a part of Menlo Park that it, where Facebook is encroaching. And so they talked to me a lot about how that faith community had to really press back against Facebook's expansion and testify at the city council and really um, make, make claims for why they shouldn't lose their churches, why those buildings shouldn't be torn down because this building, you know, this corporation was expanding. Hmm. I think I think it's related to another question that came came in about how have you been thinking about houses um, and emplacement in, in Silicon Valley? And 
um, housing and land. And it's also a comment that I, I think comes up a lot you know, in the coverage of the book. You know, there, it seems like there's people who ask, well, why don't people leave? You know, why, why, do, they, why do they stay there given you know, the situation that's there? So I wondered if you could talk about that. Fred, what do you think of that question? Great question. Um, so first off, um, most folks, uh, I think, do come and go. They just do it kind of slowly. So Annalise Axenian, who was formerly the Dean of the Information School at, at, at Berkeley, has written a beautiful book called The New Argonauts, which is about international tech workers who come to the Silicon Valley, work for about 10 years, and then go home and start companies there. And 40% of Silicon Valley's inhabitants were not born in the United States. So that's, that's quite a number. And so, so it's really a very international place. It feels a lot like Manhattan on different days. Um, and that's actually one of the glories of it. If you, if you, so I come from Boston and uh, without telling too many tales out of school, when I was brought home by my future wife for the first time to her parents, uh, they were very curious about what my family did, what its background was, where it came from, was I from a good family? That's a very New England kind of question. Would never occur to people to ask that question in California. California, we're all from somewhere else, or almost all of us are from somewhere else. And so I think one of the, the appeals of the place is that you can imagine that you can be whoever you want to be, you can be flexible. And one of the myths of the tech industry is that if you have a good idea, you could find a couple of VCs, gin it up and off you go, and you will find through tech, the kind of expressive individualism that is at the deep heart of American, American mythology. So I think that's one of the, one of the myths. Um, over time, I think people discover that it doesn't quite work that way. Um, the financial opportunities are serious. People do make real money here. Um, others don't. Um, and, it, and, it, and it varies. So I think the money's, money's really powerful. I think people get trapped sometimes. And then there are a lot of folks who um, come to the Valley, are unable to buy things here, and so uh, unable to buy houses here or even rent here, and so live several hours away, but live their working lives here and commute out. Um, so I guess what I would say is, uh, without knowing the exact precise mobility numbers, my guess is that mobility in and out of the valley is much higher than it would be for other regions in the United States. Um, and I think that's, that's almost certainly true. Um, and I think people stay here as long as they can figure out a way to try to make it work or as long as they're still dreaming. I think there's another aspect too, which is people who are in the Valley who've been there for a very long time and have watched it change, like the pot suddenly boiling all around you. You know, like Fred and I had a meeting with someone at Stanford just a couple of weeks ago who said, my kids, my kids can't come back here. You know, it's the first generation where my kids can't, my kids, kids can't come back to live, which is, I guess that's common in, in other parts of the US, but people like Ted and Belhaven, who's like, yeah, they want a million dollars for my shack, but where am I going to go? I've spent my whole, I've spent my whole life here. And if I sell it for the million dollars, I mean, I'm going to have to live far, move far away in order to make that money, you know, turn that money into a new home. So I think it's just disorienting for, for, for so many people. Yeah, and, and, and maybe I want to touch on one other thing that you said, which is the, the thing that drives me nuts in this particular question is not actually the housing or the land, which are, you know, the land here is quite polluted. It's one of the most polluted regions in America, even though it's also one of the most beautiful to see. It, it, it's, it's that companies like Facebook and Google and, and to some degree Apple make their money parasitically on top of our social lives. It is precisely our communities, our the energy that we put into expressing ourselves and to navigating our relationships with others that gives rise to the data that can be mapped and monetized and resold. And then as that's yeah. happening, our communities on the ground are being that's broken apart, being promised the individual expression, but being delivered a kind of community in which it's very difficult to know and, and love one another. Now, I, I will note there was a question in the in the chat earlier about um, how, did we look at the role of the county? Um, and, and so there's a couple of different counties in Silicon Valley. Um, we, we didn't for the book per se, um, but I'm very aware of a lot of that. I'm very active in some of it. Um, I'm particularly aware of the library system and I celebrate it, um, you know, and, and, and so there are forces here that are really trying to sustain and build community. But I will Absolutely. also say that lots of people working really hard on that. Yeah, you want, Mary Beth, do you want to say more about the people you know working in that no, space? No, 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 go ahead. But I, I, I saw that question too. And of course, you know, Silicon Valley Rising is only one group. And my entree to so many of the people in the book was through the people who were working on behalf of workers. And, and you know, and this is the part of the talk where I, my husband's words are like, don't forget, you're not an economist. You know, you don't know, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, I want all the people at Stanford to come up with a solution to these problems. I mean, what does it take to, to roll it back? 
back to the kind of corporations that did invest in community health. I don't really know what exactly that looks like, but this is our contribution toward advocating for that. But Fred, go ahead. I don't want to go down that road. You were going to say something. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's, that's, that's kind of got it. Um, I, I'll, just, I'll just hold there. Back to Joe. No, I mean, I think that that kind of the, the contribution of the book is another is segues great into a kind of a, almost final question. Um, so I think we're, we're running running out of time, but I, I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about the impact that you hope the book will make now that it is out in the world. Well, for me, I mean, I think that we see that trickle down <laughs> it doesn't happen. And if you are going to work, if you're going to devote your life in, in one of these corporations, I think you should have your, your own personal and psychological and spiritual health should be intact. I mean, to the extent that you're contributing in a way that in the way to the benefit of this company, you should be given back a kind of security. And, to, it, it, and what we want Silicon Valley to be is not just um, an oddity or, or a kind of window into a, an environment that isn't connected to the reader in Buffalo, but in fact, a kind of end game tale about where the country's headed if um, corporations and if this kind of economic model is, is keeps, keeps galloping forward. So I want that to be really clear. I want everyone in the country to be able to say, oh my God, look where we're headed and how do we rein in corporations to divest something. As Richard says, we're not trying to bake the company. We want a cooler, you know, health insurance. You know, we're not talking about billions. We're talking about a kind of standard of living that is much for a, to ask for American workers. Yeah. What about you, Fred? Yeah, so I, I've, I've developed a really immodest, not at all modest ambition for the book. Um, so, so folks, some of the folks on the call will know that I've, I've been a historian of the 50s for quite a while. And um, I've studied the Family of Man, which is the most widely seen photography exhibition of all time, mounted in 1955, 500 images of people from around the world. And that, 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 that exhibition and book was created at a time when racism was, was raging, when we were still loathing the Japanese and the Russians and the Germans for World War II. It's, it's created 10 years after the end of World War II. And it offered in its images a way to look at people who were different than yourself and yet appreciate their likeness to you. And that book for the next 50 years was in most houses in America. It was the thing that you gave as a wedding gift. It said, I appreciate people. I appreciate people not like me. And I celebrate the kind of community that we might build together in our marriage, in our families, in our communities. I hope that people look at our very small and modest book by comparison and see people unlike themselves and see themselves in those people and see their own hopes and dreams and see the possibility of not just the Silicon Valley, but an America where we can live and work with people who are very different than ourselves with very different beliefs for the good of everyone and not just the good of a few. That's excellent. You usually Thanks. talk about wealth, wealth distribution, redistribution. Are you gonna say that? You want me to go down that road too? I mean, I, 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 mean, I was trying to- Yes, say yes. Uh, yeah, because it's not enough that we just see everybody and say, I see myself in you. I mean, I see myself in you and I care if you have, you know, if you have rent to pay. I'm really glad you get a chance, the, the folks on the call get a chance to see me, me and Mary Beth in, in, in <laughs> natural habitat. <laughs> yeah, mean, so, you know, so, I see myself in you is a kid. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so, so I think that the seeing myself in you is the first step toward taking action. So, right. so, um, right. You know, one of, the, one of the people in the in the chat mentioned that that they do see their Takadia person and they know the folks in their neighborhood and I I applaud that I know mine as well, but you know we gave a talk at Stanford uh, a week ago and the very first question that we got was how come I've never seen these people before I've lived here since 1983, and so I, I think that kind of seeing not seeing goes on a lot, and I think that before we can make the kinds of calls for income re redistribution wealth re redistribution that we do in fact need to make. And before we can send elected representatives to Congress and other places to make those moves, we need to just start by recognizing that, hey, this is our show. We're here together. And, and I think, Mary Beth, that that's, that's, that's the work of photography in, in that larger project. That's why we did the book. Got it. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Deirdre, do you have anything you want to say um, before we close? Uh, I will just say that uh, I know the three of you have referenced a couple different 
books um, and uh, various authors over the course of the call. So I have everybody's contact info from the Eventbrite. So I can send a message. I can kind of round up the different works that uh, have been referenced and then you know send out a list to everyone. We'll follow Thank up. You. That's great. You know, Joe, I want to say one other thing about the book, just in my Barnum capacity. And this is like Chicago did really well. The book is priced like a reasonable paperback book. So yeah. sometimes when you buy books, they're $60 or up and, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should buy one. So for folks on this call, the book is you know 20 some dollars. And like the right. family of man, it is meant to be um, shared, thumbed. And, and, and I think Joe, the fact that Chicago priced it there may, has made it possible for it to have some of the impact that it's having. Right. Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, uh, thank you for the support that has, has allowed us to do that as well. And, and for all the work that went into this, I, I'm, I'm glad that the book is getting out there and it sounds like people on the chat are already looking at how to buy it. So we're, we're off, off to a good start. Um, great. Um, does anyone else have, have anything else at this, this point? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your, your taking the time to, to chat with Mary Beth and Fred tonight. And um, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for everything and, and, and congrats and um, look forward to, to hearing more about the book as, as publicity continues. So thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Deirdre. Thanks, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Joe. Everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, Brockton. Bye.